Today is a very special day. Today marks the day that the Flying Scotsman, the most famous steam locomotive in the world, turns 100 years old. And since those 100 years, the Flying Scotsman has captivated millions of people around the world, starring in many movies and television shows, even making several appearances in Thomas and Friends and the Railway series. But beyond the engine's appearances on the silver screen and television, the Flying Scotsman is a long-lived and well-traveled engine, with many records and accolades to its name. And like every story, it all starts at the beginning. Flying Scotsman was by no means the first engine of its kind. There are two other A1-class engines built by Doncaster in the early 1920s before the railways were grouped into four large companies in 1923. The first engine was number 1470, Great Northern, and the second, Sir Friedrich Banbury, was number 1471. Both engines were built in 1922 by Sir Nigel Grizzly in Doncaster Works, and briefly served for the Great Northern Railway until the Railway Grouping Act. Flying Scotsman, on the other hand, was built on February 24, 1923, but was built for the newly formed London Northeastern Railway, and was nameless, with only the number 1472 to identify it. Little did the world know that this nameless runt in the litter would go on to become the most acclaimed locomotive of all time, starting in 1924. In a year of uneventful service and with no name, 1472's fortune would change in the right direction very soon. During the 23rd of April to the 1st of November 1924 was the British Empire Exhibition, a large-scale colonial exhibition that would show the world the wonders and creations of the British Empire and its colonies. Officially inaugurated by King George V on April 23rd, incidentally St. George's Day, the exhibition held in Wembley Park, London became a resounding success. Many of the railway companies were eager to show off their new engines and coaches, and the LNER, who was keen to impress, was no exception. And so the engine they picked was their newest, biggest, and possibly the fastest one, in that case 1472. The engine was taken to Doncaster and was clean, polished, and decked out for the exhibition. And when the engine was unveiled at the exhibition, the world came to know 1472 not as the nameless express engine, for now like Great Northern and Sir Friedrich before it, the engine now numbered 4472 had a name of its own. Flying Scotsman. Even though the engine had this name and number for quite a while at this point in time, it was only now that the world recognized Flying Scotsman by its name, and not its number. Flying Scotsman is not the only big engine displayed at the exhibit. There are also competitors from other railways, such as Great Western Railways, Care Philly Castle, and various other steam engines of other railway companies, such as the LMS and the Southern Railway. The Egg Empire exhibition happened twice, and Flying Scotsman participated both times, being paired up with GWR's Pendennis Castle in the later exhibition. After the exhibition concluded, Flying Scotsman became the flagship engine of the London Northeastern Railway, along with the newly named express train of the same name which would pull from London King's Cross to Edinburgh Waverley. Very soon, the A1 class evolved from a trio of express engines to an entire family, a good majority of them being named after famous racehorses such as Solario, Victor Wilde, Lemberg, Prince Palatine, Blur Athol, and many, many others. Although some, such as Centenary, Prince of Wales, William Whitelaw, and even Sir Friedrich Bramberry are named after other things like people and events. The A1s and subsequent A3s, which are essentially a more powerful version of the existing engine, continued to be constructed into the late 1920s and early 1930s, and throughout that time they were the king of the LNER system. By 1928, the LNER made another bold move by making the Flying Scotsman a non-stop train. To make this work, 10 engines, Flying Scotsman especially, received a new type of tender that had a crewman's corridor so that crews could be changed halfway throughout the journey without needing to stop, as well as a water scoop to pick up water from track pans on the main line. Flying Scotsman continued to raise the bar higher and higher, being the first steam locomotive to be recorded going 100 miles per hour sealing a three-decade-long international dispute on which steam engine would be the first to officially claim such a feat. Even after being outclassed by the streamlined A4s such as the record-making Mallard, Flying Scotsman continued to be used for passenger service until the outbreak of war in 1939. From this point onward, things would change immensely for both Flying Scotsman and the whole of the LNER, a situation 
the whole world was not prepared for. World War II proved to be very hard on the Flying Scotsman and his class, particularly maintenance. The complicated process of maintaining and fixing the three-cylinder valve gear that was a staple of Nigel Grizzly's engines was simply unsuitable for wartime conditions. The engine would lose its apple green paint and be painted over the black finish to make it less visible to Nazi bombers. As if it wasn't bad enough, yet another tragic snag hit for the LNER. 1941 saw the sudden death of Sir Nigel Grizzly, and subsequently was replaced by his successor, Edward Thompson, who was notoriously known to be very critical of Grizzly's work. From 1945 onward, the LNER would go through an immense standardization program, where many of Grizzly's designs were heavily rebuilt, and to the opinion of many, desecrated. Despite being renumbered twice due to a new numbering system implemented by Thompson, Flying Scotsman remained mostly unaltered during Thompson's brief tenure until the 4th of January 1947, when it was rebuilt into an A3 like the rest of its A1 brethren under the leadership of Arthur Peppercorn. This rebuilding alone would change Flying Scotsman forever.